hope everybody enjoyed their little break and lunch, but let's get started. Next we have Dr. Darla Burnett. She is a clinical psychologist at the Neuromedical Center Clinic here in Baton Rouge. Dr. Barnett is also a native of Louisiana and received her undergraduate degree from LSU. She went on to obtain her master's and doctoral degree in clinical psychology from the University of Southern Mississippi. She completed her pre-doctoral internship at the University of North Carolina School of Medical Department of Psychiatry in Chapel Hill um, of North Carolina School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry at um, Chapel Hill. She worked for the Department of Justice at Butner Federal Correctional Institute. She also earned her postdoctoral degree in clinical, and I'm hoping I'm going to say this right, psychopharmacology at California School of Professional Psychology. So with further ado, welcome Dr. Barnett. I want to start by just making sure, can everyone hear me? I've been sitting in the back watching the whole day and I know it has been a little hard sometimes, so we're good? Okay. First, I want to start just by thanking those people who organized this event. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank all of you guys for being here and spending your afternoon learning about this disease. I'm going to focus primarily on psychological conditions that are associated with Parkinson's disease. I think this is going to actually segue really well with our presentation that we had first this morning. So I'm hoping you guys will find this interesting. So first thing I'm going to talk about is, again, kind of segueing from this morning's lecture, Parkinson's disease is not just a movement disorder. So the movement or motor symptoms are often the symptoms that are most recognized, often the symptoms that bring people in to seek treatment, but there are a lot of non-motor symptoms that are important. And I list several of those there. And the last three there highlighted sleep disturbance, cognitive dysfunction, and psychological symptoms. Those are what I'm going to focus on today. So Parkinson's disease, in some of the research, has been referred to as a neuropsychiatric disorder. So there are a lot of psychological conditions that can be associated with Parkinson's disease. Those are depression, anxiety, psychosis, apathy, impulse control or disinhibition disorders, cognitive impairments, and sleep disorders. So I'm going to take each one of these today and kind of break them down and talk a little bit about each of these areas. So the first question is, why do we need to recognize these things? And why do we need to treat these things? And the biggest issue is quality of life. Oftentimes, the psychological symptoms that can be associated with Parkinson's disease can have a bigger effect on quality of life than some of the motor symptoms. Also, untreated psychological conditions can lead to more rapid changes cognitively for people, or maybe even some more rapid changes in motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And the other reason is that we have treatment options for most all of these, treatment options that are useful and helpful. So again, you know, make sure you talk to your doctor about these things. <laughs> So let's talk about some of the causes of psychological conditions, for example, depression and anxiety with Parkinson's disease. We look at these as both having a biological component and a psychological or a stressor type component. So biologically, specifically with some of these psychological conditions, these may appear, as we learned this morning with Dr. Chitness, before the motor symptoms. So this tells us that there may be some manifestation of the underlying disease process of Parkinson's disease that's leading to these psychological conditions. There could be neurotransmitter changes, again, kind of what we learned this morning also, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA. These are all neurotransmitters that are involved in psychological conditions, but also in Parkinson's disease. There can be changes in brain structure or brain pathways, and then inflammation as we've also heard this morning. So when you have these biological conditions in conjunction with some of these psychological stressors, we sometimes see 
disorders such as depression and anxiety manifest. Some of the psychological stressors we may have with Parkinson's disease are the stress of coping with a chronic and unprogressive disease. Maybe a sense of grief related to a diagnosis you received of Parkinson's disease. How has this diagnosis affected your life as far as your ability to perform your job, your quality of life and your social interactions, your life with your family, whether it's a perceived loss or an actual loss in these areas that can be a stressor. Some people may have embarrassment because of their motor symptoms. They may isolate themselves more. And then there's just a lot of worry about what is my life going to be like now that I've been diagnosed with this disease. So a lot of times we have these biological underpinnings. We have these psychological stressors with that. And together we see a manifestation of psychological conditions. So first we're going to talk about depression. So I have a few little, hopefully you'll find funny slides from in. It's after lunch, we've got to keep you entertained a little bit. But my teenage children did not find this funny at all. But I, it was cute. I made them listen to my talk for practice. We're, at, we're, at, we're available, I'm going to talk about some of the prevalence rates for these disorders. Prevalence rates can be a little confusing for people because they sometimes have very wide ranges. So like in this slide, we have from 20 to 40 percent of Parkinson's disease patients may be diagnosed with depression. Prevalence rates come from research. Research defines depression differently. They use different samples. So sometimes there's a, a, a range of rates with prevalence. So within those 20 to 40 percent of patients who have Parkinson's disease who are diagnosed with depression, 5 to 20 percent of those may experience a form of major depression. 10 to 30 percent may exhibit, exhibit, I'm sorry, milder forms of depression. This next statistic, as a mental health professional, is the one that bothers me the most. Only about 20 percent of Parkinson's disease patients who have depression are treated for the depression. So there's definitely an unmet need there for treatment. Again, which is why it's important for you to talk to your, your doctors about any of these symptoms you're experiencing. So let's talk about what to look for with depression. Depression has affective symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and physical symptoms. So I'm going to kind of quickly go through each of these and kind of talk about what these are. So affectively, we have sadness and irritability. A lot of people think depression is just being sad. A lot of times people who are depressed are not necessarily sad. They're just very irritable, grumpy, not in a good mood. Okay? There can be feelings of hopelessness feelings of helplessness, feelings of worthlessness. In depression, we often talk about people having what we call a negative triad, a negative view of yourself, a negative view of the world, and a negative view of the future. And this is where these hopeless, helpless, worthless feelings come from. People with depression often have poor motivation. It's hard for them to get up and go to work in the morning. It's hard for them to mow their grass. It might be hard for them to take a bath every day. There's a poor motivation. There's also something, this is a big psychology word, anhedonia, which is when people lose interest in things that they normally would enjoy. Like, I no longer want to play golf. I no longer want to go out with my friends for dinner on Friday night. I no longer want to do my book club, whatever it may be. There are symptoms of loneliness and feelings of emptiness. And then there can be a lot of guilt as affective symptoms. Cognitive symptoms include poor concentration, slowed thinking. So a lot of times people who are experiencing depression will tell you they feel like they're kind of in a fog, like they're just not quite as quick as they used to be when they're trying to think about things or talk about things. There can be um, thoughts of self-harm or suicide associated with depression. And oftentimes people are very forgetful with depression. They'll come in thinking they're having memory problems when in reality it's a symptom of their depression. And then there can be physical symptoms appetite changes. With depression, we have both increases in appetite or maybe cravings for non-healthy or not as healthy foods. We also can have a decrease in appetite where people just don't feel hungry. Food doesn't, you know, isn't something they think about. We can have what's called psychomotor retardation. This is kind of exactly what it sounds like. People just move and interact a little slower. And then we can have changes in sleep. And we can have what's called hypersomnia, which is where people have an above normal level of sleep. Uh, I've had depressed patients sleep as much as 16 hours out of the day. 
We can also have insomnias where people have a harder time falling asleep or staying asleep. We can see both in depression. Okay, so these are some of the things to look for. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about anxiety. About 25 to 40% of Parkinson's disease patients may have some form of an anxiety disorder. The on and off fluctuations that people have with their Parkinson's disease medicines can sometimes be a risk factor for anxiety, especially in those off periods. The types of anxiety that we most often see with Parkinson's disease are generalized anxiety, social anxiety, panic, and phobia. I'm gonna spend the majority of my time today talking about generalized anxiety, but I am gonna to just touch briefly on these others just so people will know what they are. So social anxiety, probably pretty self-explanatory. It's when people feel nervous or anxious in social situations. So situations like presenting in front of a group of people or something as simple as going to the grocery store where you're gonna be around other people. Panic is when people have what's called maybe like an anxiety attack. So they have a sense of maybe uh, feeling overwhelmed, feeling extremely anxious, maybe feeling like something bad's gonna happen or this sense of doom. And along with that, there's usually physical symptoms like chest tightness, heart palpitations, sweating, flushing. Some people feel like they're having a heart attack. That would be a panic attack. And then a phobia is just a fear of avoidance of a specific thing like heights or water, those kind of things. So let's talk a little bit more about just generalized anxiety. So anxiety is when people have excessive worry or apprehensive expectation about things. And even though these people know their worry is irrational, and they know that what they're worried about probably will never happen or it might not make a lot of sense, they can't control the worry. That's what a generalized anxiety is. Often people who are anxious feel very restless. They have a hard time sitting still. They have a hard time relaxing. They may be irritable. They may also have poor concentration. You can see some overlap here between depression and anxiety, and there is a lot of overlap sometimes in these conditions. They may have muscle or other forms of tension. People may clench their jaws. You may you know, feel your neck muscles tighten. They may clench their fists. They just have a lot of tension. People with anxiety often have poor sleep. So you can imagine if you're having excessive worry and then you lay down at night and everything in the world around you quiets down, what is your brain gonna do? It's gonna worry, worry, worry. So people with anxiety oftentimes have a difficulty sleeping. And there can often be fatigue. So we just talked about these people being restless and having a lot of tension, which can then lead to people with anxiety oftentimes feeling fatigued. Okay. Next, we're gonna talk about apathy. So at its core, apathy is a motivational disorder. People have a reduction in goal-directed activity. They may lack interest in themselves. They lack interest in the world around them. They're not necessarily sad or depressed, but they often just lack emotion. The prevalence rate for apathy in Parkinson's disease is between 30 and 70%. Apathy may occur with depression, but apathy can occur on its own without a diagnosis of depression. And a lot of times, family members or caregivers mistake apathy for someone just being lazy or not caring about things. So again, it's something that's important to recognize and talk about with your provider. Okay, next I'm gonna talk a little bit about psychosis. So psychosis is kind of a larger term that contains several other smaller symptom presentations. So it may present as delusions, hallucinations, milder symptoms of illusions, and ideas of presence. About 15 to 30% of Parkinson's disease patients may experience psychosis. And I'm gonna talk about each one of these individually a little bit. But a lot of times, psychosis will occur secondary to our dopaminergic therapies. But psychosis can also occur as part of the disease process itself. <laughs> Visual hallucinations are often the most common type of psychosis that we see with Parkinson's disease. Visual hallucinations usually are of animals or people or things like that. People may see kids in their yard doing something 
They may wake up and see an animal on their floor or on their bug on their wall, something, something like that. So a hallucination is where you hear something, feel something, see something that's not based in reality. Okay? A delusion is when you have a belief that is not based in reality. So an example may be that someone believes that someone has come into their home and moved items in their house around, or they believe someone has come into their home and taken things. They may feel like their spouse is not really their spouse. I had a patient once who felt like he was not living in his actual home, but a replica of his home that had been created. Okay, so that's, that's an example of a delusion. An illusion is something that is based in reality, but is distorted in some way. So an example would be someone looks in a closet where there's clothes hanging in the closet, but what they see is people in the closet. That would be an illusion. <coughs> and an idea of presence is also something that can be found in Parkinson's disease. And that's when someone feels like there's someone or something present with them, but it's just out of their, just out of their vision. They can't quite see it, but they do feel that it's there with them and that can occur also. Again, it's important to talk with your providers about these symptoms because, some, like I said, some of this can be medication related and there may be some things they can do there, but there's also other treatments for psychosis with Parkinson's disease. So impulse control and disinhibition. So again, we may see these symptoms as a side effect sometimes of the type of therapies that we use. Dopamine is, um, a neurotransmitter that we find in the reward center of our brain, so it rewards us for things. The prevalence rate for impulse control or disinhibition with Parkinson's disease is anywhere from 6 to 17 percent. Usually the way these things manifest are in some type of compulsive or repetitive behavior. So things like gambling, shopping too often, hypersexuality, excessive walking without a purpose, people just walking, food cravings, and something that's called punding. So punding is when someone has a repetitive, purposeless behavior. They may take apart things and put them back together over and over. They may sort things into piles or into categories and do this over and over. Those are examples of punding. A lot of times these things can be very disturbing for the patient and for the family members, especially if we have things like gambling, shopping, you know, things that are gonna affect other people in their lives too. So again, these are really important to address. Cognitive impairment. So Parkinson's disease patients can have cognitive impairment with or without a diagnosis of dementia. Usually this cognitive impairment is related to some type of dysfunction in the areas of the brain or in the neurotransmitter systems. The prevalence for what we call mild cognitive impairment is about 25 to 30% of patients with Parkinson's disease. Mild cognitive impairment means that someone has had changes cognitively, has had some decline in cognitive functioning, but it's not necessarily to the point where it's had a lot of impact on their daily life and functioning. The prevalence rate for dementia and Parkinson's disease is estimated to be anywhere from 20 to 40%. Dementia would mean that someone's had maybe a little more significant change cognitively, and it is to a point where it's causing difficulty in their functioning in daily life. Early recognition of cognitive change is really important, but it is sometimes complicated by other things, like we just mentioned, both depression and anxiety, to present with sometimes people feeling they have poor concentration or forgetfulness, um, having poor adjustment to their condition in general. Some of these things might look or present like cognitive impairments. So we'll have to tease those out when we, when we work with people. So what do we look for with cognitive impairments? So up here I have listed a lot of areas of cognition that can be impacted. I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about each one of these. A lot of times the place where we see changes first is in executive functioning. So executive functioning is our ability to plan. It's our ability to organize information it's our ability to have insight and judgment. It's our ability to kind of self-monitor and self-regulate ourselves. Processing speed is pretty simple. It's kind of what it sounds like. It's the speed at which we think, process information. We can sometimes see that start to slow down. Attention, usually the place we see attention affected first is in what we call working memory. 
So that's when you're trying to work out maybe mental math or something like that inside your head. Usually, um, as memory changes progress, we'll see more difficulty with what we call simple attention tasks. Language can be affected. We'll see people who have uh, poor naming. So you might show a person an object and they have a hard, a hard time telling you the name of that object. We may also see changes in fluency. This would be, I would give you a category and I would ask you to tell me everything you can think of in that category and how well you can do that is your, is your ability to be fluent. Those can have, that area of language can have change also. And then there can be some visual, spatial, visual perceptual changes. Things like, um, I, I can't do a drawing as well. I might not recognize faces as well, those type of things. And as psychologists, we have ways to test each one of these areas. So if you felt like you're having any of these changes, you know, you talk with your doctor and they may refer you to someone like me um, who can do some more formal assessment in these areas and kind of see if we are having any changes that we need to be concerned about. Okay, okay last I'm going to talk a little bit about sleep. I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not a sleep specialist, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the sleep disorders we might see with Parkinson's disease. One is insomnia, and as I said earlier, insomnia is difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. Hypersomnia is again when people sleep too much. Parasomnias are things that happen usually while you're asleep, so nightmares, night terrors, sleepwalking, sleep paralysis, those type of things. And then, as mentioned earlier, the REM sleep behavior disorder. This is kind of the way you think about it is like people are acting out their dreams while they're asleep. These conditions can all occur without having Parkinson's disease, but they are found in patients with Parkinson's disease also. And as mentioned earlier, usually you would end up working with a sleep specialist with some of these. All right. So what should you do? If you feel like you're having any of these symptoms, the biggest thing is you have to start a conversation with your provider because that's the first step towards being evaluated in a more formal way or looking toward treatment options. And the good thing is that we do have a lot of treatment options for these things. There are medications that work very well for a lot of these conditions. There are different types of therapies that work really well for a lot of these conditions. I feel like I'm gonna beat a, a drum again, but exercise is important. There's a lot of research that shows us that regular exercise is beneficial for mood, anxiety, and cognition. So exercise is very important. Same thing with a healthy diet. We have lots of research that tell us following a healthy diet is good for mood and cognition. For those of us with Parkinson's disease, being involved in a support group is sometimes a really important thing. It's a way for you to be able to talk with people who understand you, who know where you've been. It's also a great way to get support and to maybe learn some things about how you might manage your disease that other people have learned along their journey. And then remaining socially engaged is very important. Again, there's a lot of research that tells us that Remaining active socially is good for cognition, good for mood, those type of things. The big thing is just know that there are treatment options. And I don't have enough time today to go through every option of treatment for all these, but there are options and that's the important kind of takeaway point. And lastly, as a mental health professional, I just want to encourage anyone here who's a family member or a caregiver of a, someone who has Parkinson's disease, taking care of your physical health and your psychological health is just as important as the health of your loved one who has Parkinson's disease. So don't forget yourself in the process of, of dealing with this disease and make sure you take care of yourself too. And that is the end of my slides. I'm not sure. I think I